over to you. We are reading uh, Psalms 118, 1 and 2, and then 19 through 29. <coughs> oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, His steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous will enter through it. I thank thee that thou hast answered me and hast become my salvation. The stone which the builder rejected has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's joy, it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech thee, give us success. Blessed is he who enters in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festival procession with branches up to the horn to the altar. Thou art my God, and I will give thanks to thee. Thou art my God, I will extol thee. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. <clears throat> Isaiah 54 through 9. The sovereign Lord has given me an instructive tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears, and I have not been rebellious. I have not drawn back. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who poured out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and speeding. Because the Sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore have I set my face like him, and I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. He is the Sovereign Lord who helps me. Who is he that will condemn me? And from Philippians 2, 5 through 11, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Scripture in no way 
tells us to do something really weird. It tells us to obey God. And uh, that's where we are, literally, in our church, to act in a biblically focused manner to bless our community. That is, that's God's mission in our lives. And so we don't do weird stuff. What we do is biblical stuff. There was uh, thinking about the end and, and the fact that it is coming. Uh, we have to prepare for it. There was a, a pastor who I call a semi, semi-wise pastor. He said that uh, he told me it was biblical that Christians ought not to think too much about such things, about the end and all, because it could hinder the return of the Lord. And then he quoted Matthew 24, 44. He said, the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you think not. All right, some of you will get that over dinner. <laughs> there was a poster outside an English church at a bus stop that read, where will you be on the day of judgment? Somebody scribbled underneath right here waiting for this bus. <laughs> well, so much has been written about the, the end times and the return of Jesus at times. I think it becomes important to stop and review the facts. And that's what these two verses are for us this morning. In our text, the angel speaking to John has underscored what John has seen in this vision of visions, namely the revelation of Jesus Christ as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He has seen the master of all life and death and time and eternity. Jesus is revealed not only as the king of the universe, but the embodiment of the word of God Almighty. Jesus Christ is seen as the word. How does the book of John, the gospel, start off? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was talking about Jesus, the whole book, the whole gospel of John is all about Jesus. So what we're given here in this text of two verses are some assurances, two of them. We see two assurances that strengthen strengthen what we are and who we are and who we must be due to the awesome facts that they represent about the Word. Let me unpack that a little bit. We have two assurances here that are so important to us, it is as that first word starts out, behold, in the King James Version. <clears throat> behold means what? It means, listen up. What you're about to hear is so important. You need to focus. You need to pay attention because this is life-changing stuff. Two assurances. The first assurance is that the Word of God is eminent truth eminent truth. Revelation 22 and verse 6. Then the angel said to me, everything you have heard and seen is trustworthy and true. Faithful is the other word rather than trustworthy. This translation says trustworthy and true. Faithful and true. The Lord God who inspires his prophets has sent his angel to tell his servants what will happen soon. There's a lot of truth to be known. Um, truth about me, I'm a father, I'm a son, I'm a husband, I'm a grandson. Uh, these are truths. These are just facts, aren't they? But eminent truth is a truth that stands in first place above all other truths. And that's who Jesus is. He is the eminent word of God or the eminent truth of God. Eminent truth is that that takes first place in importance. There are two realities about that. The word faithful or truthful, mean or trustworthy, rather, means being convinced. The truth of God about Jesus can be put to the test and it will never fail. So the word faithful or truthful, trustworthy, means being convinced. All doubt is removed because it's been proved over and over again. Um, I don't know how to say that more clearly than Two and two is, you always know that. Why? Because you tested it over and over again. You had two quarters, then you had two more. That's a dollar, right? And you know exactly what that is. 
So the word faithful or trustworthy here means being convinced because you know it's true. But the word true literally also means unconcealed, opened up. What is the name of this entire series of so far 31 messages that we've talked about? The name of this series is the unveiling of Jesus Christ. It is pulling back the curtain to see the entirety of who Jesus Christ is. That's what the book of Revelation is all about. And that's why it's such good news. That's why it's, it's not something to be feared. A number of you, most of you, I would say, at one point or another, when I've talked with you about, you know, here we are studying the book of Revelation, what do you think? I've heard you say over and over again, it used to be considered scary up here. But it's beginning to be less so now. Why? Because as we have investigated the book of Revelation, we have found Jesus, the picture of Jesus. He is not scary. Now listen, <clears throat> riding a white stallion charger with a sword in his hand, yeah, you know, that's a scary picture. But listen, is there ever a friend that you had who's better than Jesus? I mean, what a friend we have in Jesus. Amen. So, unconcealed, the fact that God has totally revealed his nature, who he is to us in the, in, in the being and the character of Jesus Christ, you can depend upon him. This is what eminent truth is all about. First place truth is that Jesus is our friend. We can depend on him. So when John says that the word of God is faithful and true, He's assuring us that truth revealed from above can be trusted, can be counted upon. During the Civil War, uh, Jeb Stewart, in his communications to General Robert E. Lee, used to sign his communication this way, yours to count on. And that's exactly that way with the Word of God. It is ours to count on. Now, what that means for us is that a God who spoke the world into creation and a God who spoke the word through the ancient, ancient prophets and eventually by a cross is a God who is going to live by that word. His word is faithful and true, trustworthy and true. The phrase in verse 6, the things which must happen soon, tells us that God confirms a promise that his word issues. What are the promises that are being confirmed here? Well, all throughout the scripture, there are two basic promises, and they are as unchanging as the God who issued them. Promise number one is that the redeemed are going to be received with great gladness by God. The second promise is that the enemies of God are going to be defeated and silenced forever. Those are the two basic promises. You love God. You can't wait for his appearing. He is going to receive you greatly, lovingly embrace you. But if you despise God, if you hold him at arm's distance and say, no, I'll live my life my way, you will eventually be in the party that is defeated and silenced forever, apart from God from forever. Now, the world may point to the existence of this world and the apparent lack of judgment and say, you know, it's not going to happen. But listen, the day shall come. It is God who has spoken. And that day, when the separation of the sheep and goats happens, it will come. I read a long time ago about uh, a night in March of 163 years ago, whatever year that was, the great Niagara Falls. Anybody ever been to Niagara Falls, stood next to those things? You see the water coursing over. I mean, tremendous, tremendous uh, uh, awe-inspiring sight and you can feel it as much as you can see it with that water coursing over so many millions of gallons per second. But on a night in March, 163 years ago, that falls stopped like that. Just stopped dead. Anybody who slept in the country with the crickets knows how deadly silent it can be when all of the night sounds stop, right? It can be really unnerving. Imagine what it must have been like 
that night for the thundering of the mighty Niagara River and the falls to suddenly cease. Just like that. Like somebody turned off the switch. Silence. People were so startled they ran to the river with torches. And the next morning, all and, and all through that day, and all through that next night, the nearby churches were jammed with people praying and trembling over the end of the world. Man, if the Niagara stopped, man, alive, it's got to be the end of the world. But a little over 30 hours after the river ceased moving, just as suddenly, the waterworks was turned on again. What's the explanation? Well, the uh, natural explanation here is that a heavy wind had set the Lake Erie uh, ice field in motion. Lake Erie is what feeds the Niagara River. And tons of ice had jammed at the river's entrance of a buffalo. It had dammed the river up until the ice shifted and the water started to flow again. Now, someday, things like that are not going to be a natural explanation, won't have a natural explanation, but rather a supernatural fulfillment of the eminent truth of God that he is going to bring time to a standstill. Just like the Niagara River stopped, time will come to an end. And God, having ended time, will begin eternity. And those who have lived their lives without God will find that eternity will be the same way. They will live eternity without God, separated from their Creator. This is eminent truth. God has said it, and that settles it, whether it's good enough for us or not. Eminent truth is the first assurance that the angel gives us here in the book of John, the book of Revelation. The second assurance that we get is the notice that the word of God is also imminent treasure imminent treasure. Revelation 22 verse 7. Look, I am coming soon. Jesus didn't say I'm going to send my emissary. I didn't, I'm not going to send an angel. He said, I am coming soon. This is the return of Jesus Christ. Blessed, he says, are those who obey the words of prophecy written in this book. Very often, when I teach children, I know Debbie does this often, she said, what does that word mean? Right? You, you, you throw out a word, you say, what does that word mean? You want the children to answer back. Why? Because you want to know that they're tracking with you and you're not saying something they don't understand. That's what Jesus is doing here. He says, look, I'm coming soon. Blessed. What does the word blessed mean? Literally, it means, oh, how happy. Oh, how wonderfully happy. That's really the definition of that word. Bless, oh, how happy are you who obey the words of prophecy written in this book. The angel quotes Jesus saying, I'm coming soon, imminently. Imminent is like on the brink. You're standing there uh, at blowing rock and you're leaning over, you know, with all the wind whipping by like that, you know, however many thousand feet down, right? Imminent means it's just about to happen. That's our thinking. But let's investigate a little bit more. The news that Jesus said, I'm coming soon, can be either treasure or tragedy. Jesus coming for Christians is imminent treasure. For those who are standing apart from God, it is a imminent tragedy. Depends on the state of the one for whom Jesus comes, right? Now, I don't want to be cute with words here because the outcome, folks, is much too serious. Again, the world looks around and even some church members say, well, it's been 2,000 years. Is he really coming soon? What's the emphasis on the word soon? Meaning that, is it going to be next week? Is it Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, when? Soon does not mean soon in the sense of time. It means effectiveness or at the right moment. And Debbie asked what the word meant. I'm, I'm going to blurt it out right on time. Why? 
because that's what coming soon means. You know, G. Campbell Morgan, G. Campbell Morgan that great Baptist preacher, translates this sentence this way. He said, Behold, I come on time. I like that translation. God has never missed a deadline. At least, he's never missed a deadline that he set. He misses plenty of mine. You know, a lot of times in our prayers, what do we do? We tell God exactly what we want, but we also tell him when we want. Lord, I need this yesterday. But God not only knows what we need, he knows exactly when we need it as well. So, what is he coming for? Well, he's coming for two things. He's coming for judgment, and he's coming for blessing. Uh, I read about a man who was on trial as a defendant. Uh, during the trial, after several weeks, he came to uh, he came to the judge and said, I'm going to plead guilty. I'm going to change my plea to guilty. And the judge said, why don't you just plead guilty at the outset, save us all this time? And the defendant replied, well, I thought I was innocent, but when I heard all the evidence against me, well, I had to change. <laughs> How sad that there are so many good and moral and outstanding and wonderful people who have just never given their hearts to Jesus who are going to hear in that day of judgment, depart from me, I never knew you. You see, you don't have to be a murderer. You don't have to be a child abuser. You don't have to be of some other heinous kind to go to hell. All that is required is to ignore the call of God on your life, to ignore the prior claim that God has on your life, which by definition is to reject Jesus, the imminent on-time coming king who said it this way, I am the way, the truth, and you can quote this with me, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no woman, no child, that's added on my part, nobody comes to God, the Father in heaven, except through me. That's what Jesus said. Those words should be in red up there. Why? Those are the words out of Jesus' mouth. I am the way, truth, and life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And to reject that, to reject placing your faith in Jesus Christ is to say to God, no, I do not need your salvation. Thank you. I will live life my way. Blessings, says the angel, come to the ones who keep or obey these words of the prophecy. The word keep or obey comes from a military expression. It means to say on guard, to keep watch. I spent some time in the army. I know all about being on guard duty. You know, sometimes they hand it out as a punishment, but other times you're just on the schedule. But I can tell you this, there was a huge difference between doing guard duty at Fort Gordon, Georgia, and doing guard duty or keeping watch in Cantum, Vietnam in 1967. The difference wasn't just in keeping a few rules. It meant the difference between life and death. And folks, that's the whole idea with this book. It is our warning, it is our understanding that when Jesus comes, he comes to judge the quick and the dead, the living and the dead. He comes to judge the sheep from the goats. He comes to separate us. Those who have trusted in Christ as opposed to those who have rejected Christ. It's not just keeping a few rules. If you think that's what church is all about, somehow you missed the message. It's not. It's not. Trust me, you can't keep enough rules to make God happy. And you can't break enough to take him off. The point is you're already lost. If you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ, you're among the lost. But Revelation calls the goats. The sheep are those who know Jesus and follow him. The goats are the ones who have rejected. Sheep are kind of dumb. They would wander and get hurt. I always hated that Jesus chose to call us sheep. But when I consider the alternative, goats are rather irascible creatures. They're not very cooperative. They want what they want. That's why they stick their neck through the fence, right? In Doing what you do to keep 
watch over the imminent treasure of Jesus Christ in your life. Again, T. Campbell Morgan says this about the words of this book and what the angel says here to assure us, that he is eminent truth, that he is eminent treasure. T. Campbell Morgan says it this way, this emphasizes the fact that a study of this book, study of the book of Revelation, is only of value insofar as the vision of the Lord in his glory and his grace and his government reacts upon our life in such a way as to produce the attitudes and activity which recognizing the glory, appropriating the grace, and yielding to the government. In other words, you square your life by the words of this book and you commit yourself. That means making the imminent, effective, on time coming of the Lord Jesus a real treasure in your life and in the life of people that you meet every day. How do you do that? Speak English, Russell. Well, commitment is a very elusive thing to some people, is it not? Is it not? I mean, sometimes you see people that come up to the brink of a commitment of any kind, but do they follow through with it? There was a young man who was afraid to make a commitment to get married. He wrote to an advice columnist, and she answered him in the column, and this is what she said. She said to the young man, you fall in love, but you back away before marriage. You say you won't commit because you view life like a buffet. If you fill up your plate with lettuce at the front of the line, you may not have room for the boiled shrimp that could be at the end of the line. She said, my friend, you are going to wind up with an empty plate. And that's what it's like if we reject the Jesus of this book. So what shall we do with this palm passion truth? This eminent truth this imminent treasure, when you know the divine, eminent, all-important, imminent truth of God's love in Jesus Christ, and you have the experience of the imminent treasure of having Christ in your life, what's the appropriate, acceptable response? If you've accepted Christ in your life, what do you do with that? You share it, don't you? Isn't that what we do? with our friends, neighbors. Mahatma Gandhi said that if Christians would really live the teachings of Christ, all of India would be Christian today. Our Mormon friends have a commitment that means that they give two years of their life in missionary service without getting any pay for it. Members of Alcoholics Anonymous <coughs> will go anywhere, anytime, under any circumstances to help another alcoholic stay clear. It should come as no surprise to Christians that our mission is to receive the eminent truth, that first place truth, the word of God, and take this eminent treasure to the ends of the earth, and where do we start with that? All right, everybody look this way. We start in our own homes. Is there one who doesn't know Jesus Christ living in your home? That's your mission to you. If your neighbor to the left or to the right or across the street doesn't know Jesus Christ, that's your secondary missionary field. You get what I'm saying? We start wherever we are. Our mission is to receive this eminent truth, the word of God, take the eminent treasure, the treasure that's about to break in at the right time of God's choosing, starting with our own homes and our next door neighbors and on down the street and spread out to the uttermost parts of the earth from there. The question is this, would we go around the block to share with a neighbor or even our own home? Because Jesus says, Behold, I, the eminent, imminent one, I come on time and I bring my judgment with me. And here's the question for you. 
Are you satisfied that you're ready to greet me when I get here? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. There's one word that expresses how to take that imminent treasure. It's found in your hymn note on page 389. Freely, freely. We're going to stand together and sing the stanzas of this hymn. I want you to be thinking as we're singing this for the Lord Jesus Christ, eminent word of God, imminent on the brink of coming at his choosing when he will suddenly, effectively to judge the sheep and the goats. Think about the news that you received and became a Christian. It's time to give that truth away freely just as you receive it. Let's stand together. <laughs> Thank you.